Can we have one more loud salawat for Sheikh Jafar, please? So those who are taking notes, we have to put Sheikh Jafar's name and his family's name in the list of the people who we will inshallah pray for. Yes? And the shopping list. Okay. Shopping list will come as well. So uh, Alhamdulillah, we are on schedule. So our next speaker is uh, my friend, my brother, Sheikh Akil Karim. Uh, Sheikh Akil Karim uh, has been uh, a volunteer uh, in this group as well for a number of years. He has accompanied us uh, in the Hajj trips, so he is fairly familiar with the Fiqh Masiles. Now, this is the most important part where you, all of you have to pay your full attention. Uh, for those who are listening online, please also make sure that you are really seated for this session. And uh, Inayat Bhai always uh, tries to cut Akil's time every seminar. So we have given him an hour to cover the most difficult aspects and uh, very detailed aspects of the Fiqh Masiles. But again, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, for those who are not here, uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, in any group you go, you will have scholars with you. There will be a lot of time in Medina if you are going to Medina first before you proceed for the, the Hajj rituals. So there will be enough time, the lectures will be repeated, uh, material will be repeated, and there will be opportunity for you to ask questions and uh, answers as well. So with another loud salawat, please welcome Akil, please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى محمد وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا رسالة من سلوات فنو بليس In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful All praise belongs to him is, is he controlling uh, from there? Computer's frozen, okay. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. <coughs> okay, so the, uh, it, it seems we're having some technical difficulties. The computer is frozen, but uh, inshallah they'll uh, reboot it. Um, and um, uh, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking, and inshallah we'll catch up with the slides. The, uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, you know, Habib, I mentioned, every year they, they cut back the amount of time that they allot to the fiqh masail. Uh, which is fine, in, in because inshallah will you know you've seen the slides, uh, they have been emailed out uh, in advance, and uh, you know we'll cover inshallah the masail uh, briefly today, and you know uh, given the opportunity inshallah to be with you in uh, Madina tul Murawara and Makkah tul Mukarrama inshallah we shall uh, have an opportunity to go over the masail again uh, in those blessed lands. Uh, and inshallah, uh, you know, at, at that time we will have an opportunity to, uh, to perhaps go through them in a little bit more depth. Uh, and they will be fresh, inshallah, for all of us uh, before we embark on the blessed journey. The Masail um, that I am, inshallah, presenting uh, this, uh, uh, this morning uh, are, are, are based on the uh, Risala of uh, Ayatollah Sistani. Uh, but before I proceed, can I ask a couple of quick questions? How many amongst the audience are the Muqallideen of the Rahbar? MashaAllah, okay, so a few. Um, I will say that the differences of opinion uh, between the Rahbar and Ayatollah Sistani, as far as the Masail of Hajj are concerned, are very nominal. 
Okay? There is no significant difference between the Rahbar and Ayatollah Sistani. Uh, are there any Muqalladeen of Sayyid al khui Rahmatullah Ali? One, two, three, okay, four. Okay, so um, for the men, uh, there are some differences of importance uh, as far as the Muqalladeen of Sayyid al khui are concerned. Uh, this presentation, inshallah, covers um, the uh, Masail as per the Risal of Ayatollah Sistani. As I said, Ayatollah Khamenei, there's not much of a difference. Um, there's only one difference, which uh, primarily, which is in terms of uh, whether you have to stay exactly in proper Mina um, during Mabit uh, or not. But uh, that, inshallah, we shall cover when we get there. Um, Sayyid al Khui's uh, Masail are different uh, in, in one important regard. Inshallah, we'll cover that when we get there. Uh -huh. It's in the My, my Documents folder, other, uh, hajmasail dot powerpoint. Uh -huh. um, and then one, one last uh, uh, note in the preamble, and that is that there, there are um, uh, masail that are relevant specifically to our sisters um, as far as Hajj are concerned, particularly where, you know, as it comes to uh, matters pertaining to uh, their monthly cycles. Uh, there will be a separate session uh, where uh, Sister Tahir Abai Kasmali will inshallah cover uh, those masail that are specific to women. Um, but you know, most of these masail are applicable to all. Uh, she will only cover primarily those masail that are relevant to our sisters, inshallah. Okay. So, so that being said, uh, you know, they're, they're using, uh, they were using a, a PDF file, but uh, I've given them the PowerPoint, so inshallah we'll, we'll have that up in a few minutes. But, uh, you know, in, as far as the um, requirements for Hajj are concerned, the verse from the Quran that I recited from Surah Ali Imran uh, talks about the idea of how Hajj becomes incumbent on an individual once in a lifetime. There are certain requirements that must be fulfilled by an individual in order for Hajj to become wajib upon him or her. Hajj is not wajib upon everybody. It is wajib if certain conditions are met. So the conditions are that one must be an adult. You know, uh, Hajj is not wajib on someone who is not an adult as yet. So one has to be a baligh or baligha before Hajj becomes wajib upon them. One must be sane, mentally sane for Hajj to be wajib upon him or her. But then there are specific um, requirements about freedom and financial ability that make Hajj wajib upon an individual. So there may be individuals for whom Hajj may never become wajib in their entire lifetime. Okay, uh, but Hajj is wajib once in a lifetime. So what are some of those important requirements? One is that one must have sufficient time. Okay, Hajj these days is a two, two and a half week, perhaps three week journey. Okay, one must be able to get sufficient time off from work. Okay, if there is a risk of not being able to secure your job when you get back, and you don't have the ability to, uh, to survive when you come back, Hajj is not wajib upon you. Okay? You have to have the, the time to go and complete the rituals of Hajj. You have to have the financial means not only to go upon for the journey, but also upon your return. Okay? Now, uh, you must have obviously enough uh, Jazakallah. You must have enough funds, obviously, for the journey itself. Uh, there must be no obstacles in the journey. Uh, you know, none of those really exist uh, in today's day and age. But the other important thing is that your debt obligations that you have must be fulfilled prior to departure. Now, when we talk about debt obligations, there are both religious and non-religious debt obligations. By religious debt obligations, we're talking about khums. Okay, your khums obligations must be fulfilled prior to departure. Okay, we've had the situation a number of times in Hajj where people come to us and say we forgot. Okay, it's possible to resolve the matter there. Okay, uh, but it's difficult because you have to approach the representative of the marja to get an exception to the rule, uh, which has been done, but is extremely difficult. So please, I, I repeat this again and again, please ensure that your khums obligations are met before you leave. Okay? If you have debt obligations to fellow human beings, okay, those must also be fulfilled 
uh, except if you have you know, a large debt like a mortgage, for example. Okay? Uh, mortgage is something that most of us cannot fulfill right away before we go on Hajj. That is an exception. Okay? But if I owe a brother $100, $200 or something like that, all those debts must be fulfilled prior to departure. Okay. Okay. So um, as far as Hajj, uh, the rituals of Hajj are concerned, Hajj is divided into two. Okay. Hajj, the first part of Hajj is called Umrah Tamattu, uh, and the second part of Hajj is called Hajj Tamattu. Umrah Tamattu has five rituals, Hajj Tamattu has 13 rituals. So, the five rituals of Umrah Tamattu are the wearing of Ihram, the performing of Tawaf, the two rakat namaz that follows, the Salat of Tawaf, Sa'i, which is going back and forth between the mountains of Safa and Marwa, and uh, taqseer, which is the clipping of the hair. Okay, for ihram, there are certain important aspects of ihram. One is that ihram must be worn at a designated place. Okay, and that designated place is called miqat. Miqat varies based on where exactly you come from into Makkah. Okay? So depending on the direction on, on from which you are coming into Makkah, Miqat varies. All of us, inshallah, for those of us who, who will be blessed enough to undertake this journey, we shall be going to Makkah from Medina. Okay? And therefore, if we are leaving for Makkah from Medina, there is a mosque called Masjid al-Shajara, which is just on the outskirts of the city of Medina, about seven kilometers away, uh, where we shall wear our ihram and do our niyyah. Okay. The obligation for Umrah Tamattu is to wear the ihram at Masjid al Shajara. Now, there are three requirements of ihram itself the garments, the clothes of ihram, the niyyah that has to be performed, and then the recitation of a phrase called talbiyyah. Okay, so garments. The garments of ihram for women, regular clothes, suffices. Okay, there are no special requirements for women. You will find, however, that most women wear white clothes for ihram. However, there is no special requirement for women. Other than the fact that it should not be silk or gold, regular clothes suffice. Okay. Um, for men, uh, the requirement is to wear two pieces of white cloth, unstitched white cloth. One is the shoulder cloth and one is the loin cloth. So two pieces of unstitched white cloth. Uh, if you have them available here, you can take them, uh, or you can, if, if someone wants to lend you theirs, you can, you can borrow from here. Otherwise, in every corner of Medina, you can find ihram. You don't have to worry about you know, taking it from here if you don't have it. Uh, it's available there at, uh, at a very reasonable price. Uh, so clothes for both men and women um, should not be made of silk or gold. The clothes of ihram, must be tahir at all times. Okay? There's a difference between the clothes of ihram getting dirty and the clothes of ihram getting najis. Those are two different things. The clothes of ihram will get dirty, inevitably. Okay? That's okay. But if they become najis for whatever reason, then the obligation is to change the clothes of ihram as quickly as possible. Okay? This is why for men, we carry, we wear, the, we wear the two pieces of cloth, but we carry an extra set, an extra piece at least. In case one piece gets nudges, we have a, an ability to easily change and have that extra piece that we carry. So most of us will have three pieces, okay? Two that we wear and one extra just in case uh, it becomes nudges because the obligation is that as soon as you find out that your clothes have become nudges, if they do, then you're obligated to change them. Okay, Nia. So I'm only going to go over this slide once. Uh, it repeats itself numerous times for all the rituals. But before I do, by show of hands, how many are going for the very first time for Hajj? MashaAllah. Okay. And, uh, and how many have been before? Okay. Just a handful. Okay. How many, how many have been for Umrah before? Okay. MashaAllah. Okay. So, so, so those who have been for Umrah, um, the first uh, five rituals, which are uh, the Umrah Tamattu rituals, are identical. Okay? The Hajj rituals are the ones that are different. So, since the majority of us are first-timers, the niyyah that will apply for us 
will be the first one. Okay? And it, it's, almost, it's identical for all the rituals. So the niyyah is that I'm wearing this ihram for umrah i tamattu, for hajjatul islam, wajib qurbatan ilallah. Okay? And you, you basically what you will be doing is you will be replacing the name of the ritual into this niyyah for every ritual. Okay? If you have not performed hajj for, uh, ever before, this is your first wajib hajj, there can be no other niyyah but this. Okay? This can only be a hajj exclusively for yourself. You cannot do it for anybody else. For those who have been to hajj before and there are just a handful, you have a choice of either option two or option three. Option two is that you are performing hajj for yourself again. No problem. You can do hajj for yourself again. And this time you would say that I'm wearing uh, ihram for umrah tamattu, but instead of hajjatul islam, it's hajjat tamattu, qurbatan ilallah. And there are those who choose to do the hajj now for the thawab of others. Okay? I want to do it for my father, mother, grandparents, etc. Um, that can also be done, but only for those who have been for their wajib hajj. Okay? So it does not apply to the majority of us who are doing hajj for the very first time. For those who are performing hajj uh, for the second, ta second time or nth time, uh, you can have as long a list as you'd like. You can have 20 people on the list, it doesn't matter. And you do, uh, ideally, you would just make a list of the 20 people that you want to do this Hajj for um, and just refer to the list. As opposed to listing all the 20 names every time you do your Niyah for every ritual, have a list and refer to your list and say that I am doing Hajj this time, Niyabatan, uh, for these following individuals, uh, for the Thawab of these following individuals, Qurbatan ilallah. Okay. As soon as Niyah is performed, Okay, we said that we shall wear our ihram in Masjid al Shajara. Okay, so what this means technically is that we will put on our clothes in the hotel just because out of convenience. We will get onto the bus, go to Masjid al Shajara. In Masjid al Shajara, after typically Maghribain Salat, we will form small groups. We will guide everybody, inshallah, to perform the niyyah. And after niyyah is performed, the immediate next act is the recitation of talbiyyah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk, la sharika laka labbaik. This act is equivalent to takbiratul ihram in salat. After you do your niyyah in salat and you do your first Allahu Akbar, namaz has now begun, salat has now begun, there are certain things that you cannot do now because you are in the middle of Salat. You cannot look around, you cannot talk and so on and so forth. You are in the middle of Salat. Similarly, when you recite the Talbiyah after having performed your Niyyah, there are certain things that become prohibited on an individual who is in the state of Ihram, who is a Muhrim. The recitation of Talbiyah is recited once loudly by men. Women can recite it softly. And then it is recommended to be repeated as often as possible from the time we leave Medina until we reach the outskirts of Makkah. Okay? As often as you can repeat it. Only once is wajib, but recommended to repeat it as often as you can. The journey from uh, Medina to Makkah is, you know, in, in terms of time, can vary based on whatever traffic situation we face. But it's approximately a four to five hundred kilometer journey. Okay? It's not a very long journey. Uh, but uh, traffic situations in Hajj uh, can be such that it can take six, seven, eight, maybe even longer hours. Okay, okay so there are um, 25 uh, prohibitions uh, when it comes to the um, state of Ihram. But you know what I thought uh, I, I would do this time, uh, which I haven't been doing in the, in the previous years, is that because I'm planning to go through these Masail very quickly, I'm not going to cover them all in detail. You have seen the slides. We shall cover them, inshallah, God willing, um, in the Blessed Lands. Um, let me just ask a couple of quick questions for each section, just to make sure that everybody is, is with me, inshallah. So first question, um, true or false? Um, women are permitted to wear regular clothes in the state of Ihram including clothes made of silk? False, correct, okay. Uh, and the reason why that is false is because they are allowed to wear regular clothes but cannot wear silk, okay. Uh, men are not permitted to wear any stitched clothes in the state of Ihram, true or false? True, okay. One other note that I should make uh, as far as uh, Ihram for men is concerned is that 
um, you will find that uh, amongst the, the uh, Ahl Sunnah uh, brothers, they tie pins, they put pins into their safety pins, into their ihram. As far as we're concerned, we are not allowed to tie a knot or put a safety pin on the bottom cloth, on the loin cloth. Okay? We, can tie, we can put a safety pin on the upper cloth, but not a knot. Okay, so we are allowed to put a safety pin if you wish, just to secure the upper piece, but not on the lower piece. You will find generally that while most men are concerned about the lower piece, it really is the upper piece that is problematic. Okay, because when you go into ruku or you go into sajda, the upper piece tends to flip open. And so if you wish to put a safety pin just to secure your upper piece, that's, that's perfectly fine. The other question we often get asked is about belts. Okay. Um, you're allowed to wear a belt, okay? Uh, and there are belts that are available in, in Medina that you can purchase. Um, and and many, you know, many a time people have medication or, or they have a phone or something that they want to keep. A lot of these belts have a, a pocket and where you can put um, your valuables, a little bit of money, etc. Okay, so that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so 25 prohibitions uh, while in the state of Ihram. Some of them um, I'm going to go over very quickly uh, because they, they are not really necessary to go into a lot of detail. Um, but the others I, I want to spend a few minutes on. So as far as the first one, hunting and killing insects, we generally don't hunt in the state of Ihram. But one thing that is important is that, uh, as Sheikh Jafar mentioned earlier, uh, one cannot kill an insect while in the state of Ihram. Okay? So if you have a fly or a mosquito on you, you can flick it away gently but you cannot kill the insect while in the state of ihram. Okay? Any violation in the state of ihram of any one of these qualifies for some sort of penalty. Okay? Sometimes the penalty is nothing. Sometimes the penalty can be you know, slaughter a sheep or a goat. Okay? Or it can be even, even more, a cow or a camel. Okay? But those are extreme situations. So I, I will say this, that don't worry about the kafaras, but worry about them. In what way? While the kafaras in general are not significant, okay, slaughtering a goat it does not have to be done there. You can come home and then you can pay your kafara, and the cost of slaughtering a kafara or a goat is is inconsequential if you if you get it done in you know uh, India, Pakistan, or, or or Africa. But that's not the point. The point is that a kafara means you have violated one of the prohibitions of ihram. Okay? So while the penalty may not be significant, recognize that don't take it lightly. The purpose is not to, to do something and say, okay, I'll pay the kafara. Well, that's not the point. The point is avoid the prohibition in the first place. Okay? The kafara is just a, a way of fixing something that you've done wrong. But don't take you know, doing those things uh, incorrectly, lightly. Okay? Avoid the kafara uh, wherever you can. Okay. The next set of um, uh, prohibitions all pertain to intimacy with one's spouse. Okay? While in the state of ihram, one cannot be intimate with one's spouse. Okay? And you, if, if you've read the books of Masail, you can go through the details of that. But suffice it to say that uh, one cannot be intimate with the one significant other, one spouse, while in the state of ihram. One cannot witness a nikah uh, while in the state of ihram. Uh, there are certain kinds of social interaction which are generally frowned upon or unacceptable in, this, in general, like lying, outrage, anger, uh, those become even more strongly prohibited in the state of ihram. Carrying of arms, uh, a gun, a sword, etc. Uh, again, we don't generally do these things, but they are prohibited in the state of ihram. Okay, so those I wanted to go over very quickly. Wearing sewn clothes uh, for men, as I said, is prohibited in the state of ihram. That means that those two pieces of unstitched cloth, which you'll get from, uh, inshallah, Medina, um, are all that you wear, okay? Uh, no undergarments, nothing. Two pieces of unstitched cloth are all that men are allowed to wear. Um, as I said earlier, we can tie uh, a knot 
um, you cannot tie a knot in any of those two pieces. You can put a safety pin, if you wish to, on the upper piece. Women, regular clothes, no silk, but one other exception is that you cannot wear gloves for women. Okay. Um, next, uh, looking in the mirror. In the state of Ihram, it is prohibited to look in the mirror for the purposes of beautification. Okay. So, you know, when you look in the mirror to fix your hair or, you know, to just make sure that everything is okay, that is a glance of beautification. And in the state of ihram, that is not uh, permitted. Okay. Now, you know, if you're looking in the mirror because you're injured, for example, that's, that's okay. But any glance in the mirror for the purposes of beautification is not permitted. If there is an unintentional glance, and you will find that in Makkah, when we arrive, the hotel elevators have mirrors, right? You go into the washroom, there's a mirror, okay? An unintentional glance is, glance is okay. Um, it's when you glance at the mirror and then you stop and then you make sure that everything's okay, that now becomes a glance of beautification, okay? So an unintentional glance happens, no problem. Um, for men, covering the feet while in the state of ihram is not permitted. And by covering the feet, we mean that you cannot wear socks, you cannot wear shoes in the state of ihram. A sufficient part of the upper part of the foot must be exposed for men. Okay? So that means what kind of footwear can you wear? You can either wear uh, flip-flops, okay, where a sufficient portion of the upper part of the foot is exposed, or you can wear sandals. A sand, sandals that have you know, two strips, one in the, uh, where they cover, let's say, perhaps the toes, and one around the ankle, which is okay. But a sufficient part of the upper part of the foot must be exposed. If those straps are such that you're almost your entire foot is covered, that doesn't work. Okay? So whatever foot kind of footwear you're buying from here, make sure that a sufficient part of the upper part of the foot is exposed for men. For women, there's no such restriction. Uh, socks, uh, obviously, are part of hijab, and therefore, uh, the expectation is that women will be wearing socks and, and shoes, and, and there will be no, uh, no issue for, uh, for women. Next, uh, you will find that a number of these prohibitions all relate to <laughs> the use of, of um, some sort of beautification, okay? And the, the purpose of it, and, uh, you know, Sheikh Jafar probably covered some of this, is that, you know, there is a spiritual dimension to each one of these prohibitions, to each one of these rituals. Um, and, you know, when we talk about beautification, I guess the, the, the purpose behind all of this is to, to tell ourselves that really, you know, our perfume, our clothes, our jewelry, etc., are not who we really are. When we appear before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all look alike. Okay? All of us are wearing, in the case of men, we're only wearing two pieces of cloth. It doesn't matter whether I am a millionaire at home or I have just barely enough food to put on the table. In his eyes, that is not what is relevant. Right? And so we appear before him in the utmost simplicity. Okay? And this is one of the things that you'll find, one of the philosophical uh, basis of some of these prohibitions, that all of these forms of beautification that we generally undertake in our day-to-day -day lives are prohibited in the state of ihram. Because in, in the state of ihram, we appear before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the utmost form of simplicity. So, the use of perfume uh, is prohibited in the state of ihram. For ladies who apply uh, surma or kohal, uh, again, it is considered to be a form of beautification that is not permitted in the state of ihram. Even inhaling you know, beautiful fragrances in the state of ihram is not permitted. Now, most of our foods, we're all Indian, our foods have aroma to them. Okay? Eating aromatic foods is not a problem. But you know, sitting there and just inhaling the smell of that food is problematic. Okay, fruits have their own aroma, scent to them. Uh, eating the fruits is not a problem, but taking in that uh, scent becomes a, a problem. Self-beautification in the form of jewelry. 
Okay, we said this earlier that you appear before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the utmost simplicity. So in the case of men, uh, generally you'll find that most people wear nothing in their hands, you know, no watch, no nothing. Watch is okay. Uh, people who wear an aqiq ring, okay, that's also fine. Uh, it's mustahab obviously to wear aqiq. And so there, that's fine. Uh, but beyond that, you know, you wouldn't be wearing a chain or anything like that. For women, the rule is slightly different. For women, the rule is that any jewelry that you ordinarily wear, okay, if you wear a necklace all the time, even here at home you wear a neck, that same necklace, that necklace you can wear in the state of ihram. But you cannot adorn yourself with extra jewelry while in the state of ihram. Okay? However, you will find that the most people will take off everything. Okay? Because you know, the, the idea is to present yourself in the utmost form of simplicity before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, applying uh, oil, uh, unless it is some sort of medication that is for medicinal reasons, that is permitted. Otherwise, applying any sort of uh, oily, even ointment, uh, is not permitted in the state of ihram. Um, cutting one's nails, obviously, also uh, not permitted in the state of ihram. Removing hair from one's body. Okay, so this we are talking about a conscious removal, plucking hair uh, is not permitted in the state of ihram. If while performing wudu, for example, okay, it happens for, all, for, for men, you know, some hair falls off from the beard or from the head, um, that is okay. It's an unintentional situation where while performing wudu, uh, you know, some hair dropped off. That's okay. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's the intentional removal of hair that is considered to be problematic. And not only can you not remove hair for yourself, you can not remove someone else's hair while in the state of ihram. Okay, and, and we'll come back to that in a, in a moment as to why. Um, <coughs> covering the head for men, for women obviously they're in hijab, that's okay, but for, when, for men, covering the head in the state of ihram is not uh, permitted. And that means that wearing a hat, for example, uh, like this is not permitted while in the state of ihram. Um, the ear, Sayyid Sistani considers the ear to be part of ihram, or part of the head, sorry, part of the head. Therefore, um, if I had a phone, and we all use phones there, I cannot cover my entire ear with the phone, okay, while in the state of uh, ihram. So you'll find that you know people hold the phones a little further away or just cover a portion of their ear. That's okay. If you are if you have an MP3 player or an iPod or an iPhone or something that you're taking with you with du'as, Quran, etc., uh, you can use uh, earphones, okay, because you're not covering. Wa alaikum salam wa Recite one salawat for me, please. Salam alaikum. Um, you can cover, if you're, if you're using uh, earphones, uh, you can use earphones that, are, that plug into the ears. There's no problem. But you can use those headphones that cover your entire ear. Okay? Because again, that becomes problematic in the, in the state of uh, ihram. Um, women in the state of ihram are not allowed to cover uh, their face. Okay, while in the state of ihram. So, uh, you know, the niqab, for example, that some women may wear uh, uh, ordinarily is not permitted in the state of ihram. The face must be exposed in the state of ihram. Um, okay. While traveling, one of the other restrictions uh, that is present for men is that one cannot uh, seek shelter from the sun or the rain while traveling. This is the reason why uh, for men we travel at night, okay? Because we cannot seek shelter from the sun or the rain while traveling. This is a uh, mas'ala that is important for the muqalladeen of Sayyid al-Khui because Sayyid al-Khui's requirement is such that you cannot seek shelter, period, okay? So for those who are muqalladeen, men, not women. Women is not an issue. For men who are muqalladeen of Sayyid al-Khuyi, rahmatullah alayhi, if you travel with us on the bus, even if it's at night, there will be a kafara. Okay? Because there is no such 
uh, in, in the days of Sayyid al Khui, people used to travel in open buses. Uh, they're not readily available anymore. Okay? There are, but few and far between. And, and uh, those buses are not in our control. They're provided by the government. Uh, so we cannot control you know, getting an open uh, bus. So uh, for Muqalidin of Sayyid al Khui, you know, unless you intend to walk, which is a long, long walk, uh, there will be a kafara inevitably because you'll be traveling uh, in a sheltered bus. Um, so the restriction of seeking shelter from the sun and the rain only is while traveling. When you have arrived at your destination, okay, um, you can seek shelter in shade. Okay? So when you have reached your tent or you have reached your hotel, okay, even if it's during the day, you can go in. Okay? This restriction uh, is only for when you're traveling. Okay? So that means also when you're walking, for example, when you're walking from your tents in Mina to Jamarat, okay, you cannot seek shelter from an umbrella. Okay? And it's extremely, extremely hot. Um, and there are uh, you know, brothers from the Ahlul Sunnah who are carrying an umbrella because it is extremely hot. You have to be careful not to seek shelter intentionally under the umbrella, okay? Even despite, of, despite how hot it may be. Okay, um, bleeding, you know, one's body or uh, extracting a tooth, uh, and we'll have a dentist, inshallah, with us, uh, and perhaps more. But you cannot extract a, a tooth while in the state of uh, ihram. Uh, bleeding as well. Uh, unintentional bleeding is okay. Okay, so if, for example, you're brushing your teeth and you know your gums tend to bleed, that's okay. It's unintentional. But, you know, if, you, if you're going to scratch somewhere on your arm, for example, and you know you're going to start bleeding, you cannot do that, okay? Uh, you know, rub the surface lightly uh, if, if it's being irritated, but don't scratch intentionally to the point where you begin to bleed because that is one of the prohibitions in the state of ihram. Okay. Um, so let me, let me just ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know... And some of these will be really pretty straightforward. Uh, both men and women are not permitted to wear any form of jewelry. True or false? False. Why? Correct. Correct. So the women who wear their jewelry on a regular basis are permitted to wear the same jewelry while in the state of ihram. Um, there is no kafara if one's hair falls off unintentionally while performing wudu. True or false? True. True. Correct. Okay. Um, both men and women can take shelter from uh, the sun while traveling. False. Why? True for women. False for men. Okay. Um, okay. So this was a picture that you know, was taken uh, many, many years ago, probably six, seven years ago. Uh, the haram does not look like this anymore, okay? Uh, the latest pictures we saw, uh, I saw of the haram, the, the few of us who, um, alhamdulillah, have been blessed to be repeat offenders. We've been going for a few years. Um, there's a lot of construction going on in the haram. There are now two platforms, which we've seen in the last year. There are two platforms uh, around the Kaaba, uh, especially, and plus the haram is being expanded significantly and so there is construction galore inshallah when when you you can still see even six seven years ago you can see the cranes in the background um, now there are cranes everywhere okay there's a lot of construction going on they're in the midst of expanding the haram and it's a project that will take them a few years uh, so we don't even we don't know what state the haram will be in inshallah when uh, when we arrive okay <coughs> so um, the we said that there are five requirements of Umrah Tamattu, the first being the wearing of ihram. We shall arrive, once you wear a ihram, you get onto the bus from Masjid al-Shajara, we arrive in Makkah, the next step will be to go to the hotel, drop off your backpack, uh, do wudu, and you, you know, groups will be formed and you'll be taken to the haram for performing your Umrah Tamattu, depending on the time that we arrive. Uh, you know, we normally watch the time for Fajr Salat and make sure that there's enough time for us to perform and complete our rituals before uh, the time for Fajr Salat, otherwise it becomes very difficult. Uh, so inshallah, when we get there, we, you know, those, those details shall be discussed when we get there, inshallah. Performing Tawaf, there are five requirements. One is the uh, per, uh, recitation of your niyyah, okay? Uh, the second is ritual purity, Tahara, uh, meaning... Um, 
uh, being in the state of wudu. Third, physical purity, tahara in that sense, so there should be no najasat on your body or on your clothes of ihram. Uh, men obviously require, uh, one of the requirements for uh, being able to perform tawaf is that men have to be circumcised okay, in advance. Uh, this is not something we can't do there when we get there. Um, and then covering of one's uh, private parts when uh, in the state of tawaf. Okay. So as I said earlier, uh, the niyyah can be of one of three kinds. Okay. And most of us uh, will be are in the first category where we are performing our uh, Hajj for the very first time. Uh, the niyyah is that I am performing Tawaf of the Kaaba seven rounds uh, for Umrah Tamattu uh, for Hajjatul Islam Wajib Qurbatan Illallah. One thing that I did not mention uh, when I talked about the first niyyah is that, like every act of ibadah, okay, the niyyah must not be must not necessarily be verbally pronounced, okay. A conscious intention of the act that I am about to perform and why I am performing it suffices for niya. Okay, so I don't have to reiterate these words. We, you know, they've been handing out these niya cards for a few years. There's some problems with the niya cards, but you know, some people prefer it brings them into the right state of mind to actually verbally pronounce the niya, which is fine. The point I want to make is that it isn't necessary. Okay, so if you forget to actually verbally recite the niyyah, that's okay. As long as you're consciously aware that I am now beginning my tawaf. Okay, and everybody, and you know that tawaf is seven times around the Kaaba, that suffices. You know that you're, this is your wajib hajj, this is hajjatul islam for you, this is wajib qurbatan illallah. Just that thought that this is the act you're about to embark upon suffices for niyyah. And this applies to every ritual. Okay, it applies even to salat. Okay, as long when you're standing on the musalla on the, on the, uh, and you're about to begin your prayers, the need to verbally pronounce your niyyah is not there. Okay, whether it is for saum or salat, it doesn't matter. Okay, and the same applies for, for hajj and the rituals or the arkan of hajj. Okay, ritual purity. One must be, there are certain rituals in hajj where one must be in the state of wudu. Okay, tawaf is one of those. So when you leave the hotel, perform your wudu before you get to haram. There are places these days, convenient places where you can do your wudu, but it becomes difficult. Okay? Um, so do your wudu and our hotel is walking distance, is about five minute, seven minute walk from haram. Um, so be in the state of wudu. Now, remember the rule of four. Okay? And this applies to wudu, it applies to najasat as well that one must be in the state of wudu. If your wudu breaks prior to the completion of the fourth round, your tawaf is null and void. You come out, you do your wudu again, you go back and you repeat from scratch. Okay? Prior to round number four being completed. If, however, your wudu breaks after the fourth round is completed, then there are two possibilities. If your wudu breaks involuntarily, unintentionally, after the fourth round, you're okay. You come out, you do your wudu, you go back and you resume from where you left off. If your wudu breaks voluntarily, if your wudu breaks voluntarily after the fourth round, your, your tawaf is null and void. You come out, you do wudu, and you uh, repeat your uh, tawaf. Okay. In addition to ritual purity of being in the state of wudu, one must be in the state of physical purity, meaning that there should be no najasat on your body or on your clothes of ihram. What kind of najasat? So blood is very common. Okay. Um, someone else may be bleeding and they touch your ihram. If you find out after the fact, no problem. But if you're with your wife, for example, and she says, oh, there is blood on your haram, you have to replace. And the same rule of four applies. If discovered prior to the completion of the fourth round, null and void. If after the fourth round, you go out, you clean your foot or your uh, cloth, uh, cloth of ihram, you come back and you resume from where you left off. Okay. Okay. So tawaf itself has eight obligations. 
The first being that every round begins at Hajar al-Aswad, the black stone. Okay? And inshallah, the groups that you go with, they'll point out where exactly in which corner Hajar al-Aswad is. Every round begins at Hajar, every round ends at Hajar. Okay? So that's one round. Okay? At all times, your left shoulder must be pointing towards the Kaaba. So when you, you're going around anti-clockwise, your left shoulder must be pointing towards the Kaaba at all times. In the crowds, sometimes you may get jostled out of position, okay? If you get jostled out of position such that now your back is facing the Kaaba or you're facing the Kaaba itself, if you can turn yourself back and have your left shoulder point again and move on, no problem. But if you move around the Kaaba in that disoriented position with your left shoulder not pointing the Kaaba, you have two choices. <clears throat> you either come back, you retrace your steps backwards, and you resume from where you got jostled out of position. It's not possible. Not in Hajj. Okay? Because of the crowd, it's not possible to move back. Okay? So what happens then is you, make, you go around, that round does not count. Okay? And from where you got jostled out of position, you resume your tawaf from there. Okay? So pretty straightforward. You would have to do an extra uh, round. But resume from where you got jostled out of position because the likelihood in Umrah you can probably go back, okay, because the crowds are not as as uh, as heavy. But in Hajj it is very very difficult to do, okay. Um, next, you will find that there is the Hajar of Ismail alayhi salam, the semicircle. Uh, one must perform their tawaf around the Hijr of Ismail. Generally, you don't find people going through Hijr of Ismail. People go around the Hijr of Ismail alayhi salam to perform their tawaf. In addition, you will find a, uh, a pillar called the Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam, where you see the footsteps of uh, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. It is recommended, highly recommended to perform your tawaf between the Kaaba and the Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay? It's a very narrow gap, okay? but it's doable. The closer you are to the Kaaba, the easier it is to perform the, the tawaf in that small circle. Okay, within the Kaaba and Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the closer you are, not only is it easier, wa alaykum salam wa not only is it easier, it's shorter. Okay, if you decide to perform, uh, it is busier, clearly it is busier in that small area. It is less busy outside the Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but it's a much, much bigger circle. Okay, it'll take you much longer to perform your tawaf. It isn't wajib to perform your tawaf between the Kaaba and Maqam. <coughs> But highly recommended. Okay? So for able-bodied individuals, um, there's no reason why you can't perform it between the Kaaba and Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay. The underlying structure of the Kaaba, there's a metal plate, okay, which is visible. It's called the Shadarwan. Okay? One cannot be touching the Kaaba or the Shadarwan while performing Tawaf. So although we say get close to the Kaaba, as close to, uh, to it as possible, you cannot be trailing your hands, for example, on the Kaaba while performing Tawaf. Okay? If you have an opening, you're performing Tawaf, it's a wajib Tawaf, you have an opening and it's your first Tawaf, people are overwhelmed, you have an opportunity to touch the Kaaba. You're allowed to do that. Okay? You can go, you can touch the Kaaba, you recite your du'a, you can stand there as long as you want. And then you come back and you resume your tawaf from where you left off. You just cannot be walking while touching the Kaaba. You can go and touch the Kaaba if you have an opportunity, but your tawaf comes to a standstill at that point. Okay? Then you, when you're done, you come out and you resume from where you left off. Okay. Tawaf means seven rounds. Okay? Tawaf does not mean one round, it means seven rounds. So whether you're performing your wajib tawaf or you're performing your mustahab tawaf, tawaf means seven rounds, seven times around the Kaaba, going from hajar to hajar, okay, starting at hajar and ending at hajar. Now, <coughs> doubts, okay, in the crowds, sometimes people have doubts. Is this my third round or fourth round, fifth round or sixth round, okay, it happens. So use whatever technique you want to keep a track of the number of rounds that you're on, okay? I think they'll still be handing out those beads, seven, a counter of seven beads. People use the counter to determine which round they're on. If you are with a friend or with your spouse, you can rely on your spouse's count. If she is certain that it's the fourth round and you are uncertain, she is certain fourth round, fine, no problem. You, you assume fourth round and you continue on, okay? 
if you have a doubt and you just cannot resolve the doubt as to which round you're on, tawaf is null and void. You come back, you start afresh. Okay, for a wajib tawaf. For a mustahab tawaf, there'll be a lot of time to do sunnah tawafs between umrah and hajj. If you have a doubt about the number of round you're on, in a mustahab tawaf, you assume the lower count and you continue on. Only in mustahab tawaf. Wajib tawaf, no excuse. You have to be absolutely certain that you perform seven and, and seven only of the rounds around the Kaaba. Okay. Uh, tawaf must be completed without considerable inter interruption, um, which means that if you wish to take a break, okay, because you're exhausted, the break can be short, five minutes, ten minutes. But if I am watching you, taking a break, I should not have second doubts about whether or not you're still in the middle of tawaf or not. Okay? If you take a five minute break, you want to go out, get some zamzam water, you come back, brief break, that's fine. But you cannot go out and sit for half an hour, 45 minutes and come back. That is considered to be considerable interruption. Okay? In that case, your tawaf is null and void, you start afresh. Um, okay, tawaf must be performed with free movement, which means that you must actually, unless you're a senior citizen and you're on, on a wheelchair, it's a different situation. But for able-bodied individuals, you have to be walking and performing your tawaf. If because of the crowds you get lifted off the ground because uh, of the crowds, then the same rule applies when we said that if you get jostled out of position. What happens is you go around and you resume from that point where you got lifted off. Okay, but you have to perform tawaf out of your own volition. You have to be on the ground and walking while performing tawaf. Okay, so just a, a couple of quick pictures of what uh, the Kaaba looks like. Uh, so Hajar is where the, the tawaf begins and ends. You go around the, maqa, the Hijr of Ismail alayhi salam and you are between the, uh, the Kaaba and the Maqam of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, ideally when you're performing tawaf. Okay, that's a sort of a, um, a vertical view of the same thing and another quick picture of the same thing. Okay, um, after tawaf is completed, the next obligation, yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, I'll answer this question. Uh, but let's reserve the questions to the end so that I can finish. But the answer to that question is, yeah, okay, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, that let's say a husband and wife are performing tawaf together, and one of them has a situation where their wudu is broken, okay? If the wudu is broken for the individual, he or she must go out to resume their wudu, or they can help you complete your tawaf and then go out and finish his. Depending on whether or not it happened prior to the fourth round being completed or after the fourth round being completed. If you choose, let's say it happened before the fourth round is completed, uh, his tawaf is null and void, he has to repeat again. If you leave with him, if there is a considerable interruption between the time you left and came back, your tawaf is gone as well, okay? Because you cannot, for no, for no reason for yourself, you cannot have a considerable interruption, okay? If it's a brief interruption, five minutes, you go out with him, that's okay, uh, but um, uh, you know. So, so generally, people ask, how long does it take to perform tawaf? If you perform tawaf between the Kaaba and Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam, 35, 40 minutes. Okay, it isn't hours and hours. It's it's a very brief uh, window of time. So by the time you leave the hotel and you come back. Uh, and do your tawaf, we're, we're talking less than an hour, hour and a half. So uh, unless you have a medical reason why you cannot hold your wudu, then we're talking a different situation. Okay? That we can handle separately because it's, it's an exceptional situation. It, and there are obviously individuals like that, um, and, and there are masail for that, but not relevant for, for the general uh, audience. So um, the, as soon as your tawaf is completed, the requirement is to perform your two rakat salat, Salat of Tawaf, right after. The two rakat Salat is recited like Fajr prayers, regular Fajr prayers, but recited behind uh, the Niyyah is, is, is here. It's recited behind the Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam, as close to it as possible. Like any other Salat, you must be in the state of Wudu. 
Um, and uh, you know, there's no other speci specific requirement. You'll find that there is a section. Everybody's reciting their two rakat salat there. Uh, while there are thousands of people performing tawaf, there is a section where people are reciting two rakat namaz. Everybody's reciting two rakat namaz. You go there, you recite your two rakat namaz, and you move on. Give space to others so that others can come and recite their two rakat salat. Okay. Uh, after you've completed your, okay, one, one more thing. Tawaf these days can be performed at multiple levels, okay, because of the construction going on. We are allowed to perform tawaf, shias, are allowed to perform the tawaf on the ground floor or on the first ring, okay, because that first ring is in, within the level of the Kaaba. The second ring is above the Kaaba, the upper floors are above the Kaaba. We cannot perform tawaf on the upper ring or on the upper floors because that is considered to be above the Kaaba. So we are permitted to perform tawaf on the ground floor or on the first ring. Okay? Sa'i. <coughs> Sa'i is the going back and forth between the mountains of Safa and Marwa. Your, our requirement to be in the state of wudu ends with salat. Okay? It is not necessary to be in wudu while performing uh, Safa and Marwa. Sa'i. Okay? Uh, necessary to be in the state of purity, meaning no najasat, but not necessarily in the state of wudu. Okay? If your wudu breaks after salat, no problem. Um, the obligation is that these rituals must be performed in sequence. You cannot jump the sequence. Okay? Ihram is worn obviously, then tawaf, two rakat namaz, and then sa'i. Um, sa'i goes, uh, consists of going back and forth seven times. You start at Safa, you go to Marwa, that's one. Marwa to Safa is two, Safa to Marwa is three, and so on and so forth until you get to seven. So you start at Safa, and because it's an odd number, you end at Marwa. Okay? So not, you know, back and forth is not one. Safa to Marwa is one. Marwa to Safa is two. Okay? So uh, people have done 14 sometimes because they've miscounted. It's seven. Safa to Marwa is one. <coughs> In Safa Marwa as well, there are multiple floors. I don't know what the state of construction is right now. Um, it changes every year. We'll, we'll, when we get there, inshallah, we'll see. But we are permitted to perform sa'i on the ground floor and in the basement. Okay? There is also an upper floor. Make sure you don't take the elevators up because that is also considered to be above the mountains of Safa and Marwa. Okay? So two floors where we are permitted. Sometimes the basement is open, sometimes it's closed. We'll see when we get there depending on how the construction situation is. <coughs> the sa'i must be performed between the mountains of Safa and Marwa. They have, in the last few years, they have expanded the area where Safa and Marwa is done. And they've expanded the haram outwards. The problem with that is that when you're going from Safa to Marwa, if you are on the right edge, you're outside the ambit of Safa and Marwa. So when you're going from Safa to Marwa, stick to the middle, okay? To the left-hand side of the lane, because that is within Safa and Marwa. If you go on the right hand side, you're outside. Marwa to Safa is no problem. Okay? So make sure that if you stick to the middle of the lane on both to, in both ways, then you're safe. Um, the same rule applies as far as doubt in the number of rounds is concerned. Um, if you have a doubt and you can't resolve the doubt, null and void, you repeat again. Okay? Uh, but you can rely on someone else's count. Same rule applies for interruption. Without considerable interruption, if you stop for some zamzam -zam water and there's zamzam -zam water all over the place, there's no problem. You stop, you have a drink, and you move on. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Okay? Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because, inshallah, we'll, we'll cover this when we get there. So the, the approximate distance between uh, the, for the, for the sa'i is about three and a half kilometers. Okay? The total distance. Okay? So seven rounds is equal to three and a half kilometers. Okay, the last ritual in, uh, and, and you know, this is a good chunk of the Masail. The Hajj rituals are, are very quick because a lot of it is, is repeated. The last ritual in Hajj, in, in Umar al Tamattu, is Taqseer, okay, which is the clipping of the hair or the clipping of the nails after uh, uh, Sa'i is done. It's not necessary to be in the state of Wudu. Uh, Taqseer can be performed by clipping a little bit of hair from the head or from the beard, um, and you know, it's permitted to do nails. However, it is highly recommended to do hair first. And then if you want to do nails, that's fine. 
it does not have to be done immediately after sa'i is finished. You'll find a lot of people were there with scissors. For sisters, if you want to do, you know, cut some hair from, from your head, uh, from your hair, you know, make sure you're covered by others so that you can take off your hijab slightly and clip it off. Uh, for men, obviously, it's, it's a, it's a non-issue. But um, if you want to do it when you get back to the hotel, that's fine. Okay, you don't have to do it right there on the mountain of Marwa. You can do it when you get back to the hotel. Just remember that if you decide to do it when you get back to the hotel, then the prohibitions are all in place until taqseer is done. Okay, when taqseer is done, okay, as soon as taqseer is done, a little bit of hair is clipped off for men, for women, you do it yourself. All the 25 prohibitions we talked about earlier are lifted. Okay, you are now free to wear regular clothes, use perfume, you know, jewelry, everything is lifted. Okay, until you start Hajj, then the restrictions came back again when you wear ihram. But for now, all the restrictions are lifted once taqseer is done. When you do taqseer, make sure you do your own hair first before you do someone else's. Because in the state of ihram, you cannot cut someone else's hair. Okay, so once you've cut your own hair, this is the exception now. You cut your own hair. Now, if, if uh, someone else comes and says, have you done your taqseer? You say, yes. Can you cut mine? Yes, no problem. Okay, you cut his or hers and uh, he or she is also free from uh, the ritual or the obligations of ihram. Okay, very quickly, five rituals of umrah tamattu, ihram, tawaf, salat of tawaf, sa'i, and taqseer. You cannot shave. The Ahl sunnah brothers sometimes shave their head after umrah tamattu. We are not permitted to do that, not after umrah tamattu, only taqseer after umrah tamattu. Halaq is only after hajj for us. Okay. For hajj tamattu, there are 13 rituals. The first is the wearing of ihram. And the rules for wearing ihram are identical to the rules that we talked about when wearing the ihram for umrah tamattu. The only difference is the miqat. Okay. The miqat for hajj is masjid al-haram. Okay. So in Makkah itself, we're five minutes away, seven minutes away. Uh, instead of going to you know, where we wore it in Masjid al-Shajara in Medina, in Makkah we will wear it in the haram. And when we say wear it in the haram, meaning we wear the clothes in the hotel and go and do the niyyah in the haram. Okay. Because when you put on the clothes of ihram, you're not in ihram until you do the niyyah. Okay, so you put on the clothes, you do your ghusl, you put on your clothes of a haram, you go to the haram, you do your niyyah, you side your talbiyah, now you're technically in the state of ihram. The requirements, as we said, are the same. The garments, the niyyah, talbiyah, 25 prohibitions are in place. The niyyah is slightly different. Now you're wearing your ihram for hajjatul islam. There's no umrah tamattu anymore. Umrah tamattu phase is finished. You're now wearing your ihram uh, on, for hajj. This ihram is worn on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. Okay? Because we shall leave inshallah for Arafah on the 9th night. So 8th day at some point you wear your ihram and on the 9th night when the buses are, uh, arrive and you're told okay your bus is leaving at such and such a time you will be on the bus it will be the 9th night you will be headed towards Arafah. In Arafah when you arrive there as Sheikh Jafar said go to sleep. Because the requirement for Arafah is to be in Arafah from afternoon, from Zawal, Zohar time, till Maghrib time. So the, that is the prime time in the afternoon. We get there early for logistical reasons because there's no other way to get there. So that night time and the early part of the morning is not an obligation to be in Arafah. We are there just because it's a convenient way to get there. Plus we have to travel at night. Okay? You cannot travel during the day. So we travel at night and the men get there. And the women get there as well. And then we just wait. Sleep, rest, because you want to be awake in the afternoon. The obligation for wukuf in Arafah is uh, the ninth day of the Al-Hijjah. From Zawal to sunset. Okay, so Dhuhr time till Maghrib time approximately. And as Sheikh Jafar said, there's a tradition of, of, the, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. Muhammad In which he says, Al-Hajju Arafah. Hajj is Arafat. That afternoon is Hajj. Okay? That is the crux, the pinnacle of Hajj. And so uh, exhausted as we are, and we all get exhausted because of the heat and lack of sleep, etc. You want to try to stay awake for as good a portion of that uh, time period as possible. Okay? Stay awake because that is the pinnacle of Hajj. After the wukuf at Arafah, 
the next step is to go to uh, Muzdalifa or also called Mash'arul Haram. Okay, we will travel there at night after Maghrib Salat. Depending on what number our bus is, we'll leave for Muzdalifa. When we arrive in Muzdalifa, the requirement for Muzdalifa for men is to stay there from dawn to sunrise. Women are allowed to leave earlier, but for men, our requirement is that we shall stay there until sunrise in Muzdalifa. The other requirement uh, for Muzdalifa, or the other act that is done in Muzdalifa, is this is where the pebbles are picked. The 70 pebbles that we shall use to stone the Jamarat are picked from the lands of Muzdalifa. In, Muz in Arafat, there are tents. Okay, we shall all have tents. Maybe they'll be air conditioned. There'll be some mats, etc. Maybe there won't be any. You'll have your sleeping bags. Uh, you know, um, the, the ac accommodations are very basic. In Muzdalifa, there's nothing. Okay, no tents, no nothing. We're in, under the open skies for one night. Okay, that's why you you use your sleeping bags, etc. Okay, so we collect seventy pebbles uh, in Muzdalifa. Now, the night of the of the tenth, it is now already the tenth of uh, of Dhul Hijjah, which is now the day of Eid. It'll be the morning of of Eid. Uh, 